Thanks, everybody, for coming back on time. Uh, so it really gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to the 2023 Fred Duche uh, Distinguished Visiting Professor Lecture. The lecture is named for our longtime friend and ardent supporter of the ophthalmic education, uh, Fred Duche. And I like to, I would like to welcome Fred here today, but uh, he can't be here because he's attending his granddaughter's wedding in Boston. So congratulations to Fred and the family. But he asked me uh, to give you all his regards. So Fred uh, is a resident and graduated from our program in 1961, and he's still a constant in the FEI resident clinic to this day. Um, for more than 20 years, he's been in our resident clinic, helping them learn um, and progress through their careers. Uh, he came to the University of Rochester residency program after completing medical school at SUNY Upstate. And at the time, um, the ophthalmology department was a division of Strong Memorial Hospital's Department of Surgery. Uh, he was one of three residents um, at Strong and RGH. And unlike most graduating residents at the time, actually went into a fellowship program in neuro-ophthalmology at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary uh, under David Kogan. And then in 1998, Fred joined the faculty of the University of Rochester after a long and, and great career in private practice. And since joining, he's helped more than 60 residents, many of them gone into academic medicine, and he continues to present the residents to this day um, as a consummate physician, teacher, and friend, embodying what it means to be part of an academic medicine. And with that, I'd like to introduce Rohit Khanna. Um, welcome, Rohit. Um, Rohit is one of the leading voices in public health and in, and in public health and ophthalmology. In fact, on his way to Rochester, he stopped by Geneva for a meeting with the World Health Organization, where he's one of their leading voices in population eye care. Dr. Khanna is the network director for the public health unit of LV Prasad Eye Institute, the Gulapali Pratiba Rao International Center for Advancement of Rural Eye Care, or GPR Eye Care, as I learned. <laughs> it, was one, it was our good fortune uh, to visit LV Prasad Eye Institute uh, just a few months ago in March. Uh, we took a team of 10 members from the Eye Institute um, there to establish and reestablish uh, some collaborative efforts between Flam and Prasad. It was our great pleasure to visit with Rohit at that time, uh, and he gave us a tour of GPR, uh, so it's especially nice uh, to see him here today in Rochester. Rohit is also an adjunct professor of ophthalmology at our school, as well as a conjoint associate professor at the University of New South Wales, Australia. He's an active participant in various working groups of the International Agency for Prevention of, Blind Prevention of Blindness and World Health Organization, Dr. Khan is the IAPB Regional Chair for the Southeast Asia Region. His areas of clinical interest are cataract and glaucoma. An alumnus of the Government Medical College in Nagpur and an LVPI Fellow, he holds dual master's degrees in community eye health and public health from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and the Johns Hopkins Bloom Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Khanna has led multiple studies, including the cohort of Andhra Pradesh Eye Disease Study, a milestone population health study. He has to his credit over 150 peer-reviewed publication, is on the editorial boards of several journals, and has been awarded several prestigious research grants for his work focusing on studying the outcomes of different interventions, as well as on geriatric and eye, child eye health. In collaboration with the University of New South Wales, Dr. Khanna was involved in designing the master's program in community eye health and is also the course director of the diploma and master's program led by LVPI in community eye health. A recipient of the IAPB Eye Health Leader Award and Asia Pacific Academy of Ophthalmology's Blindness Prevention Award, Dr. Khanna has vast experience in leading capacity building initiatives and working as a consultant for both national and global organizations. Please welcome Dr. Khan as he presents the 2023 Frederick Duce Distinguished Visioning Professor Lecture, Reaching the Unreached, Impact of an Integrated Model Eye Care Delivery. Thanks, David. And it's a, it's a real pleasure to deliver Frederick Duce's lecture. And uh, really thankful to the team of Flama Institute and entire Rochester fraternity for inviting me and giving me this opportunity. So uh, while I was going through the biography of Frederick Duche, I came across one word, which was patient-centeredness. He used to teach 
he's teaching patient centeredness which is one of the first value of lu prasad i institute so very well resonates with what lu prasad i institute stand for this patient centeredness and he has been teaching for almost like more than two decades and what i felt like he always advocate for the 3h which dr rao used to keep telling about any ophthalmologist should have this 3h which is head hand and heart and you can get ophthalmologists with good heads hands and there may be more people with hand and head but very few with good hearts so if you have this 3h i think you complete yourself as an ophthalmologist or as any eye, any eye doctor or any doctor itself so i think this is what he teaches now also to the residents that it's not only the eye there is it it's not only the tissue you treat but you treat the patient as a whole so i think that's very thankful uh, to uh, dr duche that he is uh, teaching the residents and the residents are very fortunate to have him here and the famous quote from abraham lincoln which says that the best way to predict the future is to create it and i think he is creating the new generations and imbibing all the values in them which was there in 80s and 90s i used to see in all the uh, dimes of 80s 90s when we meet them i think they all talk the same thing so probably i think uh, uh, thankful to dr professor duche who is uh, imbibing this culture in all the residents and the university of rochester is fortunate to have such kind of legendary teacher who is imbibing all this culture to the students so with this i would like to start the lecture and uh, i will just give you a highlight of the global blindness picture so this is what was was published in 2020 in the lancet commission uh, which came out in 2020 which showed that there are 1.1 billion people living with visual impairment across the world who don't have access to care 55% of them are in women and 90 million children and the economic impact of vision loss is 411 billion dollars per annum which is a huge economic impact and and if you look at overall recently the different papers from the global burden of disease group the vision loss expert group which is a part of gbd and they came out came out with papers in 2010 15 20 every 5 years they come out with the paper and on the global burden of blindness and all and while the prevalence of blindness is going down but if you see the absolute numbers of blindness and visual impairment are gradually increasing all over the world and if we don't do anything now i think we will be too late for us causes all of you know that cataract uncorrected refractory error are the leading cause followed by coronary scars glaucoma diabetic retinopathy and childhood blindness the risk factors are almost same across the world when you go and listen to all the talks it's like people living in rural areas people with low income women older people people with disabilities ethnic minorities and indigenous population so there's nothing new in that and but there are some modifiable risk factors and some non modifiable modifiable being your lifestyle factors and environmental factors the things which you cannot modify is your age genetics and ethnicity which you get from your parents uh also the world report on vision as well as uh, the lancet commission came with uh, a lot of impact of vision on sustainable development goals and these are the eight sustainable development goals which have direct evidence how vision can impact all these goals and there is direct impact on vision on or eight, eight of these goals of the 17 sdgs and other sdgs are have the indirect impact vision is not only related to eye problem but there is also association of vision with other systemic issues which i was talking to your team here with the school of public health vision has association with dementia depression cardiovascular disease there are a lot of associations of vision with other health so it's eye the part of body so you cannot separate eye from the body and if you have a poor vision you are likely to have so many other problems which we don't even used to think of actually so if you start thinking then eye is a very complex organ and uh, in, every, impacting vision is one of the most sensitive sense organs also so who came with recommend this recommendation thing 2020 which was like making eye care an integral part of universal health coverage so eye care should not be in isolation but part of universal health coverage program and they also talk about talking about integrated people centered eye care and when we looked at uh, what professor duche was teaching and what we also used to follow it should be patient patient should be the center of uh, any decision you make so the keep the patient at the center and then take a decision considering the patient as a whole not his eyes or not a organ actually promote high quality research monitor trends and evaluate progress and raise awareness because there was a lot of lack of awareness i was listening to rajiv and uh, david also there is a lot of lack of awareness even in countries like america so just think about the developing countries what happening what's happening there 
coming to India. India was fortunate to have the National Program for Control of Blindness in 1976, one of the first country to have National Program for Control of Blindness. And thanks to the Prime Minister Indira Gandhi that time, who uh, pledged money for a blindness program. And subsequently, we could see the program is still ongoing. And the impact of the program is that the prevalence of blindness is decreasing gradually over the year. And recent survey showed that it's 0.36% the blindness but if you look at absolute numbers we have too many of people 140 billion population and uh, we have still 275 million people living with vision loss which is equivalent to u.s population so this is like the number of people living with vision loss in india is almost 275 almost one-fourth of the world population are in india and if you look at the economic impact this is a recent paper we came out in uh, the indian journal of ophthalmology where we showed that the cost of moderate severe visual impairment and blindness in india is approximately 54 billion dollars per annum so if you want to if you're not doing anything about it you are losing 54 billion dollars per annum in india and major challenges which are reaching the unreached population providing comprehensive eye care these are some of the list of challenges which uh, we encounter uh, in uh, in all the countries to a different extent, but it's almost everywhere. Actually, you take any developed countries, US, you take, there will be challenges. These challenges are all over the same to the extent may be less, but it's all there. So uh, I will we'll go through the LV Prasada Institute model. How did we address these challenges? How did we go through what all we went through to address all these challenges at LV Prasada Institute? So this is the LV Prasada Institute network, which spans across four states with uh, one center of excellence, three tertiary centers, 26 secondary centers, 245 primary care centers. So a center of excellence is for a 50 million population. It's, that's for the entire state, followed by tertiary center for a 5 million population and a secondary center, which is equivalent to a district hospital, which is like half to 1 million population and primary center is for 50,000 population. Uh, so uh, this unit of a uh, secondary center, which is, uh, so I'll be, my talk will be more focused on the secondary and vision, secondary center and vision center, which is the base of the pyramid, which is more of rural eye care network. The center of excellence and tertiary centers are mainly in the urban areas and uh, they are equivalent to any of your referral hospital here. And uh, the focus of our rural eye care network is mainly in the secondary centers, vision centers, and the vision guardian level. So a secondary center is for a population of half a million to one million, vision centers for 50,000, and vision guardians are for 5,000 population each. So a unit of the secondary centers, one secondary center, 10 vision centers, and 100 vision guardian forms a village vision complex. And all our studies, all our research, all of our activities, all our programs are focused in this village vision complex. And uh, at the same time, we have core values, as I talking, as I was saying in the initial uh, uh, presentation, where we, where the primary value was patient first, excellence, equity, integrity, and togetherness. So everything we do, we sh make sure that these values are not compromised. And we have ten functional arms, uh, and uh, the rural community health arm is led by me, but there are other arms, uh, functional arms of the institute. So this form the entire institute. These functional arms of the entire institute and all these arms are practiced at each level of the pyramid. So the foundation of this entire pyramid was, uh, the genesis of this pyramid was from the Andhra Pradesh IDC study, which was in 1996-2000, which gave us the baseline data for uh, prevalence of blindness and visual impairment and causes in this, in this, in our state. So at the bottom of pyramid, we have the vision guardian, which is for 5,000 population. He's a basically a volunteer and who helps in eye health promotion, screening programs. They have basically helped in screening programs, referrals, follow-up post-operative patient, and also elderly patient. At the second level, we have vision center, which is a primary eye care center, which is uh, has, uh, covers 50,000 population. And it is manned by, uh, it is the human resource at that level is a vision technician, which is a one year trained uh, technician. After high school, we train them for one year who can do a basic refraction. They don't do dilated examination like an optometrist, but they do a basic undilated examination. They provide spectacles and we don't charge any fees at this level. They're absolutely free of cost. Only the source of income is sale of spectacles and though there is no need for ophthalmologists at this level. So he is a high school graduate and locally recruited, trained uh, at our school of uh, optometry and visual science and uh, is six months is classroom training and six months is on field training. 
And with these are the basic functions they perform, which is refraction, recognition of eye conditions, referrals. They also do repo with the communities and rehabilitation and do vision. Uh, these are the basic functions what they do, slit lamp examination, vision test, intraocular pressure, teleophthalmology, refraction and dispensing. So when while we were having this system, we uh, were wondering like they were not able to pick up many glaucomas or diabetic retinopathies and retinal conditions. So we looked at what was the sensitivity and specificity of these vision technicians to pick up all the conditions. And what we found was the they had good sensitivity in picking up cataract, refractive and coronal pathology. But when we went to glaucoma or retinal pathology, the sensitivity fall down. So they were missing one out of three glaucomas and one out of four retinal, three out of four glaucomas and uh, almost three out of four retinal pathologies. So we designed another study to see whether how we can, what all we can add to the armatorium of uh, their diagnostic uh, so that they can uh, pick up more conditions of glaucoma and diabetic retinopathies and all. And then we did a study which is called GLEAMS. Uh, and what we found was if you look at this too, the diagnostic accuracy of the technician improved to almost 77% sensitivity when you use the non-mediatic fundus camera. And when we used the FDT, it was like 97%. But uh, uh, the cost effectiveness and known ability of detecting post signal pathologies other than glaucoma makes non-mediatic fundus camera more dependable. So based on that, we designed a futuristic vision center, which is like adding of a, a handle perimeter to pick up glaucomas as well as a fundus camera and a, uh, um, and a, and a folding corruptor. So these are the new uh, gadgets which were added, added to the vision center to pick up post segment conditions also. So the conventional vision center used to detect and refer and suspect and refer, and the new vision centers are detect and follow up, detect and treat, detect and refer, and detect and reassure. So their functions were increased because of adding of new equipment in the center. And uh, when we looked at data also recently, we were looking at data, and this paper is under, still under, we are writing this up, where we look at what happened, what's the difference between conventional versus futuristic. What we see is the number of abnormal referrals because of funders and all have improved the teleconsultations have improved the referrals have gone down that means people were getting care at the doorstep the vision technicians at the primary center can give the care there and then and we don't have to refer all the patients to the next level so almost 80 percent of people and patients who need referral were treated at the doorstep at the vision primary care center and only 15 to 20 percent need referral for the higher level uh, we also looked at, uh, this paper was published in Lancet Regional uh, Health Southeast Asia, where we looked at the impact of vision center, uh, uh, what is the cost effectiveness of a vision center, and we found that vision center, we were comparing with different interventions, which is eye camp, vision center, door-to-door -door screening, school screening, and all, and what we found was like vision center and eye camps have the lowest case finding and treatment ratio, but what happens uh, if you increase the number of patients if you increase the number of patient, uh, the case finding treatment ratio for other strategies increases, the cost increases, but for vision center, the cost doesn't increase. So if you have a vision center, which uh, is permanently a uh, base structure, uh, you can be rest assured that the, you can get your uh, return on investment very fast. This is, uh, we not only set up vision center in our area, but also we have set up vision center in other, uh, this is one of the, largest river island in uh, Brahmaputra. Ajuli is an island which is in northeast of India. And, uh, this is uh, the largest river island and you have to cross the river to reach that island. No other way you can reach This is the Brahmaputra river. You have to cross the river. There is no other way you can So this is the largest river island and we also had a privilege of setting a vision center in Leh and Ladakh which is one of the highest altitude it's almost like 8,000 to 10, 9,000 feet above the ground so we have a vision center at that level also. We're looking at the data of last two years we were looking at data where we found that uh, nearly we had seen last year almost 640,000 patients at the vision center. So coming to the next level which is service center we have a service center where we have the ophthalmologist a place there, ophthalmologist is and the eye care team. So it's a team of 25, 30 people, including the ophthalmologist. And so here, basic all basic comprehensive eye examination, cataract surgeries, glaucoma surgeries, and all are done. 
and this is a team of 25 and uh, we looked at the data of last year if you see we here we have a system of paying and non paying the vision center is all free but here patients pay and some of them don't pay so though if you look at the data we have almost 50% patients who are non paying if you look at the number of surgeries done almost uh, more than half of the surgeries were free of cost in last two years and when we looked at the financial sustainability, we were operationally very well sustainable, like still, even after despite treating patients 50% free of cost, we were operationally sustainable. We had to depend on capital, of our capital depend on the grants, but uh, for operation costs, we don't require any other funding from any source. Uh, we also used to, uh, uh, before we change any practice, we used to collect a lot of evidences and there was a lot of debate on the intracameral antibiotics going on across the globe and ciproxime there were a lot of papers of ciproxime coming up and then we decide but ciproxime was very expensive and giving all our patients ciproxime was getting too expensive and there was another drug which was available was moxifloxacin and we studied in a couple of centers we gave ciprofloxacin and moxifloxacin my colleague Varsha Rati was leading this study and uh, we found that there was no difference in end of rates compared during cipro cip ciproxim versus moxifloxacin and finally we switched that we will start moxifloxacin to all patients post operatively in our centers and it has drastically reduced our infection rates also and there's another story dr varsha was leading it about the koh to turn to in coronal abrasion i'll just go through it uh, so how do we diagnose coronal ulcer in this rural center so what we did was like we just asked them to use koh a simple smear of koh and to see fungus versus non fungus and uh, if this fungus you treat with antifungal, if it is non-fungal, then treat with antibacterial. That was the only principle we used. And almost 98 to 99% of patients could be treated with that. And this paper was published in BGO. And what happened in pandemic, we had no supply of KOH. And then what she came up with the novel idea of using Trifan Blue. And she used Trifan Blue and it was to our surprise, we found that we could easily detect the fungal much better compared to uh, using the KOH. And this is the paper they published subsequently, use of Trifan Blue for de detecting uh, microbial keratitis in the rural centers. And this is another paper she worked on, uh, which was published in Lancet Southeast Asia, where they were looking at if the patients present late, what's the outcome of the ulcer versus patients who present early. And if you look at the patients who presented uh, two days or later, more than two days, the ulcer development rate was 4.2 to 7 percent and who presented with within two days the ulcer development rate was only two percent that was a very significant finding and based on that we are now designing a trial to see the randomized trial whether we can uh, give antibiotics and prevent ulcer early uh, ulcer in these patients this was published in lancet southeast asia coming to the tertiary center i won't go into too much of details of that it's basically the same thing like what you see a referral center of like flama institute and all it's a basic tertiary where training research low vision rehab and everything happens and center of excellence where all the complex problems are dealt with. So now uh, the next session, next part of the talk is like, how do we bridge gap between the primary, secondary and tertiary center? This is led by my colleague, Dr. Padmaja Kumar Rani, Kumari Rani, and she is the lead of teleophthalmology from our network. And uh, what she terms teleophthalmology as healing from distance. So she coins a term that teleophthalmology is like healing from distance and Rajiv would be glad to hear that. Uh, so over the past three years, we have like almost 250,000 teleconsults done. And we use the iSmart app, which is our tablet-based application to do a teleophthalmology from primary center. So vision technician sitting at primary level takes a photograph and sends it to the tertiary center. The doctor sitting here in the command center, the doctor sitting here gives the instructions to the patient that got to be done for the patient. These are some of the pathologies which are treated from teleophthalmology. So patients don't have to travel to the next level of care. And uh, this was the paper we published again in the International Journal of Teleophthalmology. And these kind of pathologies also picked up by the uh, vision technician at the primary level. Though it, we can use this, uh, they can decide, the physician can decide whether the patient requires referral or he just requires a follow-up care. And then at the same time, when we do refer, we classify referrals as red, yellow, and green. The red are the emergency referrals, and we make sure that all the emergency referrals come and attend the, uh, go to the next level of care. And we are proud to say that almost 90% of the referrals uptake are there at, for the emergency referrals. We are working on the green and yellow. The referral uptake is right now 45 to 50%. This is an example of one of the case of retinoblastoma, which was picked up at the primary vision center and were referred to the next level of care and immediately intervention was done. The 
eye was saved as well as the patient's life was saved. Uh, same thing, this was a dancing larva which they could pick up on the slit lamp. The vision technician picked up on the slit lamp and subsequently the treatment was done through the teleconsultation itself. These are, this is a grabby device which was devised by our innovation center where the patient can take the device and take a photograph. Suppose here the transplant is coming from 200 kilometers or 1000 kilometers away. He just had to take a photograph of his eye and send it to us and then we can give an opinion on that. So this is a grabby device where patients don't have to travel always to our center and they can take their own picture and send it to us and we can give opinion there and then. Uh, this is a handled perimetry which is again devised by our innovation center. And uh, in the COVID times, there were patients who were not coming. So what did we do was like we tried to make sure, we tried to assess whether the caregiver can do, check the vision of the patient. So it was like uh, the caregiver and we found a very good sensitivity of caregiver using the peak device to, to check their vision. And this is a paper we published like feasibility study of measuring patient visual equity at home by their caregivers. Uh, this is the impact of teleophthalmology. So almost like... Uh, the kind of economic impact, and uh, I don't have to go into the details of that, but there is huge economic saving for the patients as well as you do a lot of, uh, save a lot of carbon emission also because patients don't have to travel. Uh, so we have calculated this paper is under review in BJO right now, so the amount of financial saving as well as the carbon emission saved by using the teleophthalmology system in our network. Uh, at the tertiary level also, we have uh, like post of follow-ups and all post-COVID, we designed this Connect Care app which was used for all the post-operative follow-ups. So now I don't see post-operative at one week. I usually just do a teleconsult and just send them off. So they don't have to come every one week, one month and all that. So we just finish them on teleconsult. Unless there is some problem, they, they come. So, and again, there is economic impact of using teleophthalmology at tertiary level. And this whole paper of the entire impact of teleophthalmology on, um, uh, teleophthalmology on economic impact as well as the carbon emission impact is under review in BGO. Uh, and you can do teleconsult from anywhere. So people, when they are traveling and all, also they do teleconsult. These are examples when people were traveling in train or flights or anywhere they did teleconsults. And at the same time, many uh, during COVID time, black fungus was also managed through teleconsults by our retina specialist and oculoplastic specialist. Coming to the specialty care model, we have diabetic retinopathy. We have talked in extent. Rajiv has told about that, but I'll just touch on the ROP. ROP, uh, Dr. Tapas Ranjan Padi from Bhuneshwar is working extensively on ROP and he does uh, a very live teleconsult. So what happens is like the camera, the technician sitting far away in the NICU, he takes the photograph and Tapas Sindhi is sitting at uh, Bhuneshwar campus. He looks at the photograph and says, this child requires uh, laser, this child requires referral, this child doesn't require. So very live teleconsult happens for the ROP patients and they the child need not travel to, uh, all the children need not travel, or the specialist need not go to that next level of care. Tele-rehabilitation also was done at the COVID times, and this is still ongoing, so we do a lot of tele-rehabilitation. And these are some of the publications from the tele-ophthalmology group. Uh, we have done that. And uh, coming to specialty care, so uh, this is about the primary and the tertiary level. What happens at secondary level is secondary level, Whenever there is a specialty case, instead of referring the patient to a uh, tertiary level, many of the specialists travel to the secondary level to treat these patients. And last year, we uh, 450 visits were done by all the specialists and CN 7,200 patients and operated 1,000 patients in the network. Uh, example of corneal transplant, we also do corneal transplant at secondary level where the tissue is provided by the tertiary center. The surgeon carries the tissue and the trifines and all and perform the surgery there. And the comprehensive fellow who is posted there does the follow-up. And this is the paper we published in BGO, the impact of. So what happens when you do the corneal transplant at doorstep, the follow-up rate is better. So your compliance to follow-up and everything improves. Uh, looking at retina services, we looked at the patients seen in retina services by our retina group who traveled and almost like 12,000 patients were seen by retina group and almost like nearly 400 to 500 procedures were performed and these were the conditions which were treated at the secondary level itself. 
we have a mobile diagnostic van which goes to the secondary level so instead of getting all the equipment in all the places what we did was like the diagnostic van the specialist going there the diagnostic van also goes to a secondary level the specialist goes there the diagnostic van goes so he can do all the investigations and treat the patient there and then so that coordination has to be done from our level so that the patients going there can uh, exam all the patients can be taken care of that at that at, at that level including intravitreal injections and all can be done we have also a home care. Uh, so it, it was started in the COVID time where elderly people were not coming. So we started a home care model, which was an old physician-based model, actually. Like previously, we used to have home care physicians, and now we started this. And uh, this is the initial papers, which we came from the home care. And I'll just show you a video how the home care happens. This is the home care model where the technician goes with all the gadgets and does a teleconsult from the home of the patient. They use the bike, which is uh, electrical bike, so no carbon emissions and all. They have portable seat lamps. They have got. They examine the, all the patients. They dilate. They examine the complete complete examination including application tonometry at home including vision testing and all they have a portable fundus camera they carry and they take a photograph of that patient at home Again, then teleconsult is done with the doctor the sitting at the patient so this bubble is what is causing irritation to him when, especially when he's blinking the eyes or trying to see. The patient was having just little irritation with the trap lab and then it was just, instead of coming to hospital, he was just taken care by the teleconsult team. Surya from our institute is leading this initiative. And we also do remote wet lab training. Now, instead of having residents coming to all the places to Hyderabad to do a coronal suture, a practice coronal suturing and all for the transplant, we recently started a, a pilot study where we looked at whether the fellows sitting at the secondary center can be trained for doing coronal transplant, a wet lab practice. And this was what we did recently and which was very successful. So now all the fellows need not travel to the tertiary center for learning the uh, transplant techniques and all, which can be done from the video-based consultation from remote only. Um, we do a capacity building of many other organizations across the world. And over a period of like 20 years, we have done almost 250 organizations across the world. And uh, we also are very active at advocacy level, at national and global level. We are the technical partners for all the state government in our state for the universal eye health program run by all the three states. And also we are very active with the WHO, World Health Organization and IPB. These are the documents which came out recently with from WHO uh, in terms of like for the next decade. And uh, we were very active participants and we also were involved in developing the regional action plan with WHO for the region. Uh, we not only take care of like patients, but we also make sure that the, we are environmental friendly and we have a separate initiative, which is called Go Green and there are different initiatives happening at that level, like solar energy, reusable, reuse of water, conserving rainwater, recycling of food waste, all that are part of integral part of our green initiative, improving building design, uh, planting more trees, waste disposable, awareness creation, all that. So there is a separate group, which is con constantly looking at how much energy we are conserving, how much uh, environmental friendly we are. So make sure that we do all these things so that uh, our campuses look green and healthy actually. Coming to the research uh, in the public health uh, in the past uh, 20 years, we have almost 22 grants, 52 projects, 51 projects, and 329 publications. And these are the major focus areas. We are doing research in vulnerable groups and health system research. I will. The initial started with the Andhra Pradesh IDC study, which was in 1960, which gave the foundation of the pyramid. And subsequently, we did the APETS 2, which is in 2009-10. And then we did the, so this is the largest cohort outside uh, any developed countries. The biggest cohort is like 
The longest follow-up is like Beaver Dam and Blue Mountain, followed by Andhra Pradesh IDC study. This is a 15-year-old cohort, and this is the only cohort with all age group populations uh, anywhere in the world. So the initial data came from APETS, which shows that the cataract and uncorrected refractor was a major cause. APETS 2 gave us data on cataract association of visual impairment and mortality, glaucoma and mortality. And APETS 3 gave us data on all the incident causes of blindness and visual impairment. So the papers are still ongoing. And any resident, anybody, any fellow is interested or any interns are interested, they can always use this data to write any publication. So these papers are usually written by one of our fellows or who come for internships and all. So we found that annual incidence of blindness was 1 to 1.5%. And so that every year we need to take care of at least 1% of our population so that at least we can take care of the incident cases of blindness and visual impairment. We also do rapid assessment studies, which are quick uh, rapid studies, which gives you estimate of prevalence of blindness so that we can follow them over a period of years and see whether we are making any impact. And uh, that studies on vulnerable populations. So we have done, uh, Srinivas Marmula from our group is leading the, all the elderly care studies and uh, the initial studies which he did was homes. Uh, which is basically on the elderly homes, which uh, gave us data on the elderly population in homes. Then now we are doing a clever study, which is like uh, looking at a randomized trial of vision and dementia, whether improving vision improves dementia, it's a randomized trial. And then fo followed by LEADS, which is again longitudinal study of aging and disability in the elderly population. This was a result from initial home studies, which showed that nearly 81% have some kind of visual impairment. And uh, there is 23% depression in this elderly population with multimorbidity of 37.6%. And uh, this led to the formation of LEADS. And INGEN is something which we are working with the Queen's University Belfast, uh, where INGEN stands for I Care Nurtures Good Health, which is innovation, driving safety, and education. Basically looking at four things, vision and dementia, vision and road traffic accidents, vision and mobile banking, and vision and... Uh, improvement in school performance in hyperopic children. There is enough data on myopic children's school performance improvement with glasses, but not on children with hyperopia. So this is the engine team and the clever is a study which is looking at cognition. And uh, so there are a lot of long term data which shows that vision can impact uh, dementia, but there is no randomized trial. So this is the first randomized trial being done in India. And subsequently we are going to replicate it in China also. So this is basically impact of uh, Glasses, uh, we are looking at and also looking at secondary outcomes are quality of life, falls, depression, social interaction, and physical activity. So coming to the children eye health initiatives, we have a data, we have screened almost like more than 4 and 5 million children, but data of 1.4 million children is very robust. And these are from two states, and these are the initial results from this data where we found the visual impairment to be almost less than 2%, with refractive error being the le leading cause. And these are the risk factors, which is age, gender, private schools, disability, and urban areas. And as the age increases, the uh, prevalence of refractive error also increases in this population. Uh, in the children, in the disabled children, we found that the prevalence of blindness was very high and the visual impairment was almost like 60%. So nearly 60% of these children were having some kind of visual impairment in special school, uh, which major was refractive error, amblyopia, CVI, and optic atrophy was the major causes in these children with, in special schools. And in the school for the blind, same thing. We found that nearly uh, 89, 82% uh, children were blind and 11% were moderate to severe vision impairment. And these children were given low vision. So they improved by low vision and they were put to the mainstream. And there is a special group. Uh, we also work with the tribal population, which is equivalent to like indigenous population in this country. So Dr. Dev Smita and Devanand Padi and Dr. Surya are leading this initiative. And uh, this is a tribal oversight this study, which again is in a very, very, these tribals are the very remote population where accessibility is a major issue. You have to, to go to one village. It takes almost a day actually to reach the end of the village actually. So that's difficult terrains and uh, mountains and uh, you have to climb mountains, go to these villages, screen and come back. So we found that the visual impairment was very high in this population. And we also found hypertension was very high because they used to eat the food with salt, actually. It was not vegetables. Mostly they used to eat with salt. A huge amount of salt intake was there in that population. And studies on special occupational group. And the final, we are like right now uh, working on a protocol where we are trying to see how primary eye care and primary health care can integrate. So what are components of, so we keep on talking about integration. So uh, I was talking to a couple of people and then they say, don't want to collaborate with I, uh, Flama Institute or the, the other departments. So I felt that 
what are the areas where you can collaborate it should be a mutual win win situation so what components we can use from there and what components we can offer them so it should be a two way process rather than one way so we are trying to find a model where what components of healthcare we can put in i care and what components of i care we can put in healthcare this is again a randomized trial and the results may take at least 4 to 5 years to come so overall impact uh, this is overall impact of our uh, work in the rural areas but uh, just give you a story of one center udhol which was it's a secondary care center it was started in year 1996 it finished 25 years last year it has seen almost 242000 outpatient and 75000 surgeries in almost 20 years and if you look at the prevalence of blindness when we started in this region the prevalence of blindness was nearly 50% that means one out of the two people were either blind or visually impaired and subsequently with intervention over a period of we kept on doing rapid assessment studies over a period of time and what we found that the prevalence of blindness gradually declined and recent data showed that it's 16.1 percent is still high but we have reached at least to some extent we have reduced the prevalence of blindness in this region uh, this is again same study which is the trend study where we used another area as a control and our area as a intervention and we found that the intervention area we, where we were the prevalence of visual impairment declined more significantly better the compared to the non intervention area this was published in bmj and uh, we also looked at whether we have covered the entire population of that so this was a seven vision center we looked at whether we have covered the entire population and over a period of 10 years we found that we have only covered 45% of the population that means we have a long way to go uh, over a period of 10 years having a vision center in that area we could cover only 45% of the population but still there is like more to cover the economic impact of a vision center this paper was published in asia pacific journal of ophthalmology where we found that if you set up a vision center the saving uh, of setting the saving amount of money you save by direct and indirect cost is approximately 62000 us dollar in one year so that's and the investment for vision center is only uh, 15 to 20000 dollar and that you can uh, and the return of investment is always almost comes back in one year time this is the overall impact of the institute in last 35 years we have seen 34.1 million patients and almost 4000 publications and in future so this is the this was all this happened in the past before uh, pandemic there was a uh, senior leadership which was led by nagrao who was from rochester and then he moved to india he was the uh, brain child for the entire institute and led by supported by three vice chairs which is dr tara prasad das chandrashekar and mr ramam and recently there was a leadership change where prashant garg become the executive vice chair and we are all supporting prashant garg as a uh, as a team of lvp uh, leadership programs and the next 25 years focus is on institute of excellence and primary eye care and uh, global resource centers and these are the institute of excellence we are working on the cornea institute the education child site public health rehabilitation dacrology geriatric and uh, institute of eye cancer retina institute institute of regenerative ophthalmology glaucoma institute and center of excellence for rare eye diseases these are the come of the ideas which are there and we are getting funding for a couple of them and we are looking for more funds for other areas at the same time we also want to go deeper in the community we we want to for this 150 million population in three states we want to go deeper and deeper and strengthen our primary eye care network this is the next goal and uh, i'll just show you one case study what happened is like this lady who was sent to school for the blind and she was in school for the blind and we were basically having care for she was for the blind for quite a long time మా పేరు శివరావు మా చెన్నాడుపల్లె అమ్మాయి పేరు ఎంగల్ చెన్నాడు అమ్మాయికి చూపు బాగుపడదు తర్వాత ఒంగోలు పోతే పూర్తి బ్రెయిన్ అని గవర్నమెంట్ కూడా సర్టిఫికేట్ ఇచ్చేసింది తర్వాత కరుణాకర్ వచ్చి ఇక్కడికి వచ్చి చూసి అమ్మాయికి ఆపరేషన్ చేస్తాము చూపు వస్తుందని చెప్పిండ్రు మార్కారం వెల్లి ప్రసాద్ హాస్పిటల్కి పోయి చూపించి చేసినాక తర్వాత ఆపరేషన్ చేసిండ్రు చేసినాక 
సూపు వచ్చి బాగుంటుంది అంతకు ముందు ఆ అమ్మాయికి ఏ పని చేసుకోవాలన్నా అమ్మాయి పని చేసుకోలేదు వాళ్ళ అమ్మ తోడుండి బయటికి పోవాలని ఎక్కడికి పోవాలన్నా తీసుకుపోవాలి ఆ ఆపరేషన్ చేసినాక సూపు మారి బాగుంది సొంతంగా ఆ పనులు ఆ అమ్మాయి పూర్తి చేసుకుంటుంది ఎవరి ఇబ్బంది లేకుండా వెళ్ళిపోతుంది ఎలీట్ ప్రసాద్ హాస్పిటల్లో మమ్మాయికి చూసిండు బాగైంది సార్ ఇప్పుడు బాగానే ఉంది ఆ పని ఆమె చూసుకుంటుంది this girl was fortunate enough this girl was fortunate enough to have this vision but there are many places in this world who have this kind of scenario and we don't want to have so this is a area where you need to intervene and make sure that this people nobody suffer this kind of stories which is seen in this video for so the man who trying to take care of his mother the kind of sometimes they have they don't have access to care and they have to travel and this happens in many part of the developing world including india or asia or africa so this kind of scenario is not uncommon so we want to make sure that everybody get access to care that is what called access to care near the doorstep and uh, this is a recent uh, this was economist which came out like uh, in 2012 the economist came with the article which says that universal eye healthcare is within reach and probably we need to look at and make sure that the equally the healthcare is equally distributed across entire uh, entire globe and i would just like to end uh, uh, the talk with the famous quote from jk rowling when she was going giving a graduation speech at harvard and this is what she said your intelligence your capacity for hard work and the education you have earned and received gives you unique status and unique responsibility that is your privilege and your burden if you choose to identify not only with the powerful but with the powerless if you retain the ability to imagine yourself into the lives of those who do not have your advantages then it will not be only that then it will not only be your proud families who celebrate your existence but thousands and millions of people who whose reality you have helped to change so i think everybody sitting in this room is very privileged to have access to all the kind of facilities all the healthcare and they have the power you have all have power in your hand to treat anybody who you require to so make sure you use your power properly and treat each and every who require care and who is uh, who cannot afford care and i would like to thank entire my team it's not my own work but it's the entire team who is beyond this work i am just representing my team so thanks to entire team of my uh, institute who worked who relentlessly work and still they are working on ground when i am here thank you thank you very much
Mobility in rural communities in developing countries. Has there ever been issues with like network and access with technology? And so, if so, how are you guys able to mitigate that? What you require is a healthcare post and you require an internet connection. If you have a healthcare post and an internet connection, you can easily connect to any hospitals provided you are interested to connect. So there is basic the video I showed in the last, there was no healthcare post. Had there been a healthcare post, you could have taken that. Had there been a good internet connection. They could have done a teleconsultation with them. So now and nowadays, internet is very easily available in most of the places. But still, there are places which have issues with internet. But it's slowly happening. Now, most of the rural areas in India, when a decade back, there was not there was not good connectivity. But now we have good connectivity in many of the rural areas. So I think, uh, and in this country, I don't think there is dearth of any this kind of thing. So probably I think uh, what Rajiv showed, telemedicine is one of the better way of reaching. So you don't have to get all the patients for follow up like your post of follow ups many of the follow ups can be done from home only you don't have to come here actually so you are you can get a load of more new patients more referrals rather than seeing the same patients i was talking to david and they say 20% new patients they see probably that can become 40% if you start using telemedicine properly with this follow up care So this is great that, you know, shows so much impact. And um, the one last slide, though, speaks a lot of it. You have a lot of people helping you. And staff is a really shortage in this country. You know, even staffing our clinics is a hard thing. How do we develop the human resources that we need to provide this care to our own people? I think we have to look country-specific, Rajiv. I'm not from this country, so I won't be able to give you a real uh, um, in what ingredients are required, probably. But if I stay for a couple of time and I understand your system much better, Probably I can give some insight, whatever I can understand. But uh, I think uh, human resource, and you don't require very technical expertise. When we're talking to your team, many of the team, like the highly technical expertise goes to do some lot of work which is not required for them. So how do we get that people with low expertise who can do the work which is not required by a doctor or an optometrist or somebody to do? I think that is the crux of uh, the whole thing. And the health system should agree for this because the US health system should agree to have that kind of health workers. And when you come for the IP meeting, there is a big group. So they talk about ophthalmologists and optometrists as one uh, different characters and AOP. The whole world is talking of AOP, which is allied ophthalmic personals, which can uh, help the physicians in multiple tasks, different tasks. And many of the task sharing, if they do, you don't have to do it. Like, like refractions, many of the ophthalmologists don't have to do. So, but because there is no OD or no optometrist or no technicians who can do it, they are forced to do it, but they can use their time optimally. So that system has to be made more efficient. I think every country has to, uh, the ingredients are same, the principles are same, but I think uh, country specific challenges you have to address and do go through it. Probably I will talk to you more and how we go through it and what all things are required. And I think we may come with some solution, but we are doing a great job because the kind of telemedicine structure you have set up and the kind of, I was talking to, Karen and uh, Brooke and all the kind of things you have set up is like amazing. Actually. Like I've seen uh, five years, 10 years back when I came here and now there's a huge difference which is happening here. Thanks, Rohit. That was absolutely uh, wonderful and very moving um, lecture and, and really, and I think inspires us all to do better for, for our patients and those that we can't reach. And so to commemorate your talk, here's the plaque to recognize Frederick Fusche, Distinguished Professor Lecture by Rohit Khan. Thank you.